Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for uh, a chance to be here today. We thank you for those um, that are not feeling well. Lord, we ask that you would touch them and work in their lives in a special way and help them to feel better. Lord, we know it's just miserable when you don't feel good. It's miserable being away from the house of the Lord and to, and not to be to be filled, Lord. And that's what we need. We just ask that you would fill us with your spirit. Come into this place and show us your holiness. Show us your greatness. Show us ways that we can be more like you. Lord, we know that those are, there are those that are mourning this week that have heavy hearts. We know that there are people that are missing loved ones. Lord, we know that you can comfort them and you can show them that you care and that you love them and that you have a plan. You can show them that it's alright to hurt. Lord, we ask that you would be with our time this morning as we come to Be in your presence, Lord. Uh, We ask that our focus and our attention would be on you. Lord, we ask that you would help us to worship you and to give you the praise and the honor and the glory that you're due. Lord, we thank you for all that has gone on behind the scenes this week, and we just ask that you would be with those that have brought this time of worship together, that Not only would we be enriched, but that we would be empowered and emboldened to share that love with the rest of the world that we know. Lord, we ask these things in your name. Amen. Uh, As some of you may know, Star Wars is one of my favorite movies of all time. The trilogy is just epic, and uh, it's a great piece of film, and and it, it expresses a lot of things. But what's perhaps surprising to me, I grew up on Star Wars, what's perhaps surprising to me having grown up on the original trilogy, is that the overwhelming critical and fan favorite movie is The Empire Strikes Back, the middle movie. Most trilogies have a strong opening and a fun conclusion, but slump in the middle. It's hard not to. It's really easy to rate, introduce characters and bring them in and make them interesting and come up with a compelling conclusion, but all that stuff in the middle is sometimes hard to come up with good ideas for. Uh, It's hard to do, but Empire delivers. Empire delivers. Why? Um, We see the heroes pushed up against a wall, right? After an initial victory, they find themselves constantly on their heels. Luke and Han almost die from exposure. The Empire discovers the Rebels' hiding location. The heroes in the Millennium Falcon can't jump to hyperspace. They have to hide in a cave that turns out to be a giant monster, and then they limp off to a local port headed by an old friend that betrays them for money. There's lots of crazy things that happen. Luke is confronted by his father, and their relationship is revealed. In short, it's a movie about the constant pressure from without and the temptation from within. It's about everyday people battling for their very survival. After an initial victory over Pharaoh and his armies, the Israelites begin to wander the desert. We've had a really cool intro. But we get to the middle section of our exodus, and guess what? We go through a series of trials and difficulties that threaten to undo them as a nation. Their very survival is at stake. We know how the story began, right? They're miraculously delivered from Pharaoh. And we know how it's going to end when they see God at Sinai. But this week, we're looking at the hard middle part of that story. The part where the Israelites feel the pressure of their survival. How would they respond? How would you respond? Today's message is called Under Pressure. I don't know if oh, Ben did get stuff up. Um, it's Under Pressure. And my points today are pressure points. All right? It's pressure points. Um, and we begin with water pressure. So Exodus 15, Exodus 15, 22. We're not going to read all of this, but um, just to set, set it, we're in Exodus 15, 22 through 18, 27 today. 
the first pressure that the Israelites face is, of course, water. They are in the desert. As you can imagine, deserts don't have very much water. They've just fled from Pharaoh and his army. They're pumped up, but they're quickly brought back to reality. Exodus 15, 22 through 24. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went into the desert of Shur. For three days they traveled in the desert without finding water. And when they came to Merah, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. That is why the place is called Merah. So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What are we to drink? I think immediately of those survival shows, right? Man versus Wild, Bear Grylls, Man and Wil- What's the Wilderness Survival Man one? Survival Man. Um, where they go to these crazy extremes to, to pull out just a little bit of water just to survive. Um, you know, there, there is a pressure... When the Israelites get into the desert, they have escaped Pharaoh. There's a pressure that they now need water to survive, right? They need a basic necessity. And then they find water, but it's undrinkable, completely undrinkable. They begin to grumble against Moses. No sooner do the Israelites have a miraculous delivery than they fall back on kind of their old ways. Uh, They begin to perceive the reality around them through their own circumstances instead of through God. God is above their circumstances and they need to come to those kind of conclusions. When they do come to the water source and the water is bitter and undrinkable, the Lord shows Moses. He instructs Moses about what to do. The water is made sweet and they're able to drink. In short, the lesson for them is the same lesson it is for us. God provides Right? God provides. In the midst of their troubles here, in the midst of their needing water, they need to turn to God. God alone provides them with water. God alone provides them with the way to make the water drinkable. The Israelites have to stop relying on thinking their circumstances dictate everything. This is very difficult to do, of course. That's why we have this lesson all the time. Uh, But also, uh, at the end of this, um, the Lord makes it pretty clear that God's provision comes with a decree. It is not just enough to say God provides. We must also recognize that God's provision comes under the Lord's commandment, comes by following the Lord's commandment. In 1526, he said, If you listen carefully to the voice of the Lord, your God, and do what is right in his eyes, If you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. This is a fascinating way for God to kind of wrap things up. One, (coughs) he is saying in the midst of this, I provide, but you have to listen to what I'm saying to you. You have to listen to my commandments. You have to follow me. Otherwise, you are lost. You might as well be dead in the desert. And second, he makes it clear at this point, um, which is interesting, that he is the one who heals. All right? Think about that. Think about the, the fact that when the Israelites came and they needed water, God says, I heal. Right? That he is saying, there is something more that I'm doing for you. I'm not just giving you water. I'm also healing you. I am preparing you for the rest of this journey. God is the Lord who heals you. God is the provider and healer. All right, one pressure point down, three to go. There's a lot of pressure points in this week. Um, (laughs) If not having enough water is a problem, you can imagine one of the next issues, right? I mean, we all know it's going to be food, right? If it's not water, it's food. Uh, How do do you feed a few million people in the desert, right? There's no water. There's not going to be food either because things that you would eat would need water. So you can imagine the problems. It would take a miracle, right? Oh, lights just went off on me. (laughs) <laughs> that was that was not I planned that there you go. <laughs> Ben's doing lighting this week for me too apparently um, it would take a miracle so our, our next point is pressure cooking pressure cooking if it's not one thing it's another the community grumbles against Moses and Aaron 16.3 16.3 says the Israelites said to them if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. 
There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into the desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Did you hear that? I mean, this is crazy talk. This is what happens when you're hungry. You start saying crazy things like, we had food back in Egypt, so we should have died there. Um, the urgency, the urgency of the present can make us view the past with rose-colored glasses. Right? The urgency of the present was forcing them to think about the, the, the past in different ways. They, they had to rewrite their, their history temporarily to say, oh, it was great back in Egypt. Why aren't we back there? That was, that was wonderful. Pressure makes us do difficult things, makes us see things wrongly at times. It, it, for the Israelites here, it makes them view the past incorrectly. They know the truth. They know that the Egyptian uh, hardship was more than they could bear. They had previously cried out to God in response to this. In grumbling to Moses and Aaron, they forgot that they previously cried out to God. We are quick to complain sometimes. One, one commentator says, we are quick to complain when things start to go badly. An important purpose in the pilgrimage that God leads his people through is that they must learn to trust him, and the only way to teach this lesson is through testing and hardship. Let me say that again. The only way to teach this lesson is through testing and hardship. Learning to trust God is a hands-on moment. You cannot be told trust God, right? You can't, you, it doesn't do anything for us. You can't be told, you can't be instructed just by words, trust God. You have to go through that. You have to live through that. It's an experience that needs to be done. Now, we can grow in our experiences. We may start off poorly and do better as we, as we get more time with him. But it's something that has to be experienced. You can't just, can't just say it. God provides, is the second part of this as well. God provides but requires faith and obedience, just as he did with the water. God hears the people in Exodus 16.11 and provides quail and manna in 16.13. The Israelites are told to gather what they needed in 16 through 18. In this case, the Israelites were instructed to only gather what they needed on a daily basis. Anything extra became infested with maggots and rotted. It's pretty interesting. So for the most part, Scripture often commends thinking ahead uh, in part, um, being provident and laying up, uh, you know, preparing for, for tomorrow. But... At other times, it does warn us about worrying about tomorrow. And in this case, and in this case of manna, um, the way in which the people were required uh, to gather the manna required them to rest on God's assurances, required them to trust that God would provide and gather them, gather, allow them to gather each day what they needed. And in the case of Saturday into Sunday, well, Friday into Saturday, um, they would only be, they would gather twice, and they would have to trust God that it would not rot. I mean, that would be one of the lessons that they probably learned pretty early on. It doesn't keep for two days, and you're going to tell us to gather for two days here? The people would trust God would provide for them daily. It was, that was their lesson at this point. Further, it was a test of obedience. When they disobeyed, it rotted. They, they had to learn pretty quick, I've got to obey God or I'm, I'm not going to have any food. For us today, we still need to trust God to meet our daily needs. Trust God for our needs today. Worries are ways that we think about the future and what tomorrow brings. But if we can trust God today, we can trust and provide, we can trust that he will provide for us tomorrow as well. I just want to read briefly, we know this passage, but Matthew 6, Matthew 6, 25 through 34, I think just illustrates this even further. Matthew 6, 25 through 34. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is life not more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or stow away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the fields grow? They do not labor or spend, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, 
which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire. He will not much more clothe you, O you of little faith. So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. It's also uh, a common uh, knowledge in the, um, in the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Um, to, to trust in God each day and believe that he will provide for me today and he will provide for me tomorrow is a difficult lesson to learn. The Israelites learned it in a pressure cooker. Um, we don't have that. But we can rely on him every day. So we've seen that there's trouble, not just food and water. These are serious pressures. But another incident of water is given in 17, 1 through 7, which we'll kind of pass over. But there's more water trouble. So you can imagine in the desert, there's water trouble, there's food trouble, there's water trouble again. Um, but then, as if that's not enough, and as if the basic food and water was not enough to con be concerned about, the Israelites soon face an unforeseen attack. Pressure, pressure pressure. Blood pressure. The Amalekites come and attack the Israelites at Rephidim in 17.8. The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. That, that's actually a direct quote, sorry. <laughs> um, Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand up on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. Uh, there's an account of the battle given in 9 through, uh, 17, 9 through 13, um, which I'll, I'll read. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. And when Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. What's interesting about this text is that um, it, doesn't, it doesn't worry about tactics, right? Interest, things that are interesting about battle are how do they do this? How did they overcome? It's not interested in any of the tactics. It actually doesn't tell us very much about the warfare that happens at all. But what it does tell us is that this was a spiritual engagement, right? And it, that is represented symbolic in Moses lifting his arms. It is the impact of Moses rising and lowering his arms and no other piece, no other element that determines this outcome. One commentator puts it this way, the most prominent feature of the narrative is Moses' upholding of the staff. Victory for Israel is from God. It is not a matter of having the stronger army. Victory from Israel is from God. Right? It did not matter how big the Amalekite army was. It did not matter if they were better equipped, if they surrounded them, if they used superior tactics. The entire battle centered on God's presence. All right? Symbolic, symbolically represented with Moses raising his hands. In college, this is a fun story. Susan was like, you've got to tell this story. So I already knew it. In college, I had a friend um, named Chris. And Chris... Uh, was, was a funny guy, and one of the things that he did is he decided he was going to support our college uh, soccer team, um, the girls' soccer team in particular. We had a bunch of friends on the team, and he sometimes did it for the boys' soccer team as well as we got to know them as well. But he decided he was going to be Moses for the soccer team, and I kid you not, uh, he would go down to the soccer field um, at, at game time, he would dress up in a, in a kind of a bathrobe, a brown bathrobe, so it looked kind of old, you know, Old Testament-y. He had this staff that was this tall, and he would go down to the field, and he would just stand there, <laughs> like, like this, for the, you know, the three hours that a soccer game goes on. <coughs> Chris was an amazing guy. But I learned a lot of things from this that um, make this story a little more interesting to me. One... It is very difficult to hold your hands up for three hours. Um, it is very, and holding a staff while doing it is ridiculous. Um, Chris pulled it off some days better than others, but, but this is what I know. He would come home and his, he would be like, I can't even lift my arms. Like, he just, 
You know, like there's nothing there. Um, and and you, he, he would come home and he'd just be drenched in sweat um, through the effort, right? And so what happened was Chris had been doing this for a while. And, and people know, I mean, we're at a Bible college, right? So people know what's happening. And our friends start going with him and holding his arms up, <laughs> right, to help him hold this staff while we're playing soccer games. And it was, it was a fun four years. He, he really did that for, I think, three or four years, which is crazy. But he would get hot and sweaty. He'd tell us about how difficult it was holding up the staff for long periods of time. It's exhausting. And, and he needed help. And, and at some point, people started coming along and giving him help. So here's what I know. Everyone needs support. We all need support. Uh, Moses, in this story, needs support. Obviously, what makes Moses' arms heavy is gravity. The, the weight of holding a staff above your head is exhausting. But, uh, and, and Aaron and her holding up his arms really isn't much of a spiritual act in particular, except for the fact that they realize this is what's winning us the battle? Well, yeah, let's get God on our side, right? So they come alongside Moses and they hold up his arms. The image is a, a great metaphor for one man in a spiritual conflict being supported by others. We cannot do this alone. We need one another. And here, and in the next passage, leadership gets tired, right? It is hard to hold up that staff. We need support. And so one application here immediately comes to mind, and that's we need prayer warriors, and we have great prayer warriors in this church. Um, so I encourage you, we need prayer warriors. Paul urges others to pray for his ministry, to come alongside him through prayer. He considers that a part of his ministry. We should as well. Pray for our missionaries, our national leaders, our spiritual leaders. Everyone needs support. And this doesn't just go for leaders. This goes for people, anybody going through times of difficulty. We all need support. Right? It is, you cannot hold that staff up alone. The point is hammered home even more as if that wasn't enough. Um, the point is hammered home even more in the next section. Where Moses receives a visit from his father-in-law. You know that always goes well, right? <laughs> father-in-law rolls into town. Tells you what you've been doing. Um, after reporting what the Lord did, Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, proclaims his faith in the Lord and offers a burnt sacrifice. This is in 18, 10 through 12. After that, jo Jethro watches Moses at work. And I don't know about you, but when, but when I worked at the library and my supervisor came and was watching over me, was kind of sitting right here next to me, and maybe even talking to me sometimes, it, it would make me nervous. Not because I was doing anything wrong, but because, you know, you you become pressured not to do anything wrong, right? Now, you, now I can't mess up because they will know if I mess up. Um, not that Moses was doing anything wrong either. I don't think Moses had doubts about what he was doing. But his father-in-law observes what Moses is doing and what he sees is not healthy. In Exodus 18, 13, we read this. The next day, Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people and they stood around him from morning till evening and when his father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, What is this you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone, sit as judge, while all these people stand around you from morning till evening? Moses answered him, Because the people come to, to me to seek God's will. Whenever they have a dispute, it is brought to me and I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and laws. Moses' father-in-law replied, What you are doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle this alone. Listen to my advice. Listen now to me, and I will give you some advice. And may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to them. And I'm going to skip 20, 21. But select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Have them serve as judges for the people at all times, but have them bring every difficult case to you. The simple cases they can decide themselves. That will, that will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. If you do this and God so commands, you will be able to stand the strain and all these people will go home satisfied. 
And then Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. He chose capable men. <coughs> Listen, this is peer pressure, right? Peer pressure. The pressure that Moses receives from those around him. Jethro observes that Moses is doing too much. Moses explains, the people need me. They need me to settle their disputes. They need me to seek God's will. Jethro is saying, look, Moses, as, as, as I was talking about this story, I say, look, dum-dum. <laughs> um, you, you can't do this alone. This is too much work for one person. Anybody can see that. Jethro suggests Moses selects capable leaders who he could delegate responsibility. The social setting for Moses is parallel to the battle with the Amalekites. These stories are next to each other for a reason. Moses cannot do it alone. He gets tired. Appointing helpers is not just pragmatic. It is essential. It's not just pragmatic. It is essential. Delegation helps us to stay humble. Moses thought he had to do it alone. But there were plenty of capable people within his camp who were able to do things as well. So I want to talk about delegation for just a moment. Delegation keeps us all humble. One, we have a humility in recognizing that my contributions are important but limited. Each one of us has a capacity, and some of that capacity is very large, and some of that capacity is very small. And that capacity changes in things that we do. So one may have a high capacity for prayer support while another may have a high capacity for going and visiting other people in the congregation. You know, M Moses is wise when he draws on people around him who have high capacities for leadership. And he pours into them, and they are able to share the load together. So we have important parts, but limited parts. Humility also comes from recognizing that not every concern needs to be addressed by Moses. Moses does not need to micromanage the Israelites, right? He does not need to micromanage their lives. But by pulling in other leaders, he's able to allow them to um, diffuse the problems, to share the workload, so that not everyone gets tired altogether. Finally, there's some humility in recognizing that some tasks need to be taken up for the good of the community. When Moses says, when Moses goes and he begins appointing people, he has to admit, I cannot do this myself. I need you guys to come along with me. And those people need to respond to Moses, say, yes, there is a need. Yes, I will step in. Even if I am not completely capable of what I think you are asking me, I will fill this role. God will give us strength and we'll, we will do this together. Delegating helps everyone to see that no one person is indispensable. We all have our roles. And in the community, every member plays his or her part. Just as a quick point of application, delegation allows the church body to function properly, right? So 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 12, we, we read about gifts, 12, 12 through 20, just briefly. Uh, I'll start at 14. Now the body is not made up of one part but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it should not for that reason cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body. God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. You know, each of us has gifts that we can use for the edification of the church. Doug Fields, a youth pastor, likes to say it this way, congratulations, you're gifted. You have gifts that are for the church. Congratulations, you're gifted. When you become a Christian, you enter a community of people who are also serving alongside with you, and you have been given gifts for that community. Delegation allows all members of the body to contribute in their meaningful ways. We've all felt these pressure points, right? We've all felt the need of everything going wrong. The water runs out. The food runs out. We're attacked by our enemies. We're exhausted from our jobs. Notice that all these pressure points were an opportunity for Israel to learn something about God. They learned God provides. 
They learned that they had to trust him daily for their needs. They learned that the battle is the Lord's. They learned that their leaders could not do it alone. And they grew together. They learned together. They had difficulties, yes, but God was teaching them valuable lessons in all of this. He was forging a nation after all. Right? He is pulling people together who he wanted together. We can learn, uh, we can learn from this also. We can learn that God provides for us. We can learn to trust God for today's needs. We can learn that the battle is the Lord's. We can learn that everyone needs support. And after dramatic opening sequence, after dramatic opening sequence for the Israelites, the second part of, the, of a trilogy tends to drag. There's no resolution in this part of the story. But there's hope for the future, but sometimes that hope seems far away. I want to let you know this morning that lessons are hard. These lessons in particular are hard. These are real pressure points. But God is still at work in the lives of his people going through these types of pressure. They help us to grow and mature and prepare for the next phase. And the third part of the trilogy is always resolution, right? But we'll get to that part next week. Let's pray. God, we thank you for um, your provision. God, we thank you for the way that you work in our lives. God, we thank you that you have, um, God, that even in the midst of our, our pressures, God, you are there teaching us things. I pray that we would go this week and... Um, understand what it is that you have, um, what, it, what it is you want us to learn. In Jesus' name, amen.